Well, let's get into it. And I'm very happy to welcome Mark Tedeschi on my immediate left. And next to him is Martin Mackenzie Murray. And this session is called True Crime, although we will probably disagree with that category, as all good writers do. <clears throat> Question the category, turn it upside down, shake it, and see what we can find. So I'm going to start with Mark. Bo both writers are going to read a short section from their book to begin with, and then we'll get into questions and eventually questions from the audience. So to begin with, Mark is, uh, about, as a barrister and Crown Prosecutor for 30 years, Mark Tedeschi QC has appeared in some of the most significant criminal cases in Australia. He's been the Senior Crown Prosecutor in New South Wales for 15 years and is the President of the Australian Association of Crown Prosecutors. He's had many articles published on the law and is the author of a legal textbook and the critically acclaimed biography, Eugenia. He's published many articles on history, genealogy, photography and horticulture. Kidnapped is his second work of creative nonfiction, and I'm going to say a bit about that. I should add that Mark doesn't actually like the program Crownies, but you can ask him why later. So Kidnapped is the story of Australia's only known kidnapping of a child for ransom. And I was living in Sydney at the time this happened, back in 1960, and I remember it vividly. I remember reading the headlines. I think no, nobody in Sydney at that time would have, es would have escaped the news that eight-year-old Graham Thorne was kidnapped on his way to school. Australia was gripped with fear and loathing. What monster would dare take financial advantage of the most treasured bond of love between parent and child? Incidentally, Graham's parents had just won the Opera House Lottery. And in those days, they published your, not only your name, but your address. Bradley was a most unlikely kidnapper, but his greed for the Thorn's windfall saw him cast aside any sympathy for his victim or his victim's family and drove him to take brazen risks with the life of his young captive. So Kidnap tells the astounding true story of this crime and Mark's going to take it from there with a reading from his book. Um, I'm just going to read from a section after Graham's school case has been found in bushland in Sydney. Basil and Frieda Thorne were informed about the school case on the Friday night that it was found and about the other items when they were located three days later. The police brought each item to them for identification purposes and every time it was like a stab to the heart for them to sight the objects they knew so well. While logic told them that this was not a good omen for Graham, they desperately hoped that the kidnapper had discarded these items because he didn't need them to get the ransom. They felt helpless that they could do nothing to assist their son in his time of need, and as each day passed, their fears increased. They could not understand why the kidnapper was being so elusive. Was he trying to torture them so that they would more readily pay the ransom? Surely, with all the publicity about their willingness to pay, this was unnecessary. Each time the phone or the doorbell rang, their hearts would race with anticipation and dread in equal measure, only to be dashed when it was not news about Graham. They both suffered extreme agitation, which drained every ounce of energy from their bodies. And yet Basil would restlessly pace around the house, particularly at night, trying to resist the ridiculous urge to go outside and look for Graham. They constantly wished that they could turn back the clock by returning the money they had won, if only they could have their son back. The money now seemed dirty, as though they'd done something wrong to obtain it, and they couldn't imagine ever enjoying the fruits of it in the future. How could they have been so stupid as to allow the papers to take Basil's photo with his lottery ticket? Haven't they been taught as children not to gloat? Frida was beset with thoughts that Graham might be suffering from extreme cold, as the overnight temperatures often drop to between 40 and 50 degrees Fahrenheit. She would lie in bed for hours at night, clutching the blankets fiercely up to her neck, 
with tears silently oozing from her eyes. Day after day, Basil and Frida tried to reassure Belinda that her brother would still be found and brought home. The youngster would ask repeatedly why Graham was lost and eventually ask the question she really wanted answered. Will anyone else be lost? Will I be lost? As each day went by, however, Basil and Frida's assurances to their daughter sounded more formulaic and less convincing. Thanks, Mark. And it is a, a truly spine-chilling account, particularly when you've been a schoolboy yourself, you've been sort of dressed in your uniform and you've gone off with your nice lunch that your mother's packed and you've taken the usual route to whatever sort of transport you take to school. Mark draws that, that out in a way that um, comes very close to home, I think. So uh, our second guest is Martin Mackenzie. Murray, and he's a former Canberra speechwriter and advisor to the Chief Commissioner of Victorian Police. He's also a regular columnist with The Age and runs his own blog, Feeding the Chooks. I, I did particularly love Martin's reference to one of his early speechwriting efforts, which he makes in the book, where he's preparing a speech for the Chief Commissioner of Victoria Police, and he actually mentioned Ned Kelly. He thought it was part of the, um, I guess, the history and an important part of the Victorian police uh, inheritance. He was quickly slapped down, but he recovered, thankfully. And he's written a, a wonderful book, A Murder Without Motive, which is reviewed in The Australian today. In 2004, the body of a young Perth woman was found on the grounds of a primary school. Her name was Rebecca Ryle and the killing would mystify investigators, lawyers and psychologists and profoundly rearrange the life of the victim's family. It would also involve the author's family, for reasons we'll discover. A murder without motive is a police procedural, a meditation on suffering and an exploration of how the different parts of the justice system make sense of what was essentially a senseless crime. Ma Martin. Uh, thanks. Hi. Uh, the small prefatory thing I'll say here is um, this small section I'm going to read comes towards the end. Um, I'm as, as much interested in the inner life of the Riles, um, that is Rebecca Riles, the victim's family, as I am in the case itself. The Riles are conservative. They have faith that traditional institutions confer civic stability and coherence. They are not slavish in their beliefs, are both wary of the misuse of power and the indelicacy of justice. But they are both monarchists, for instance, and Franz speaks often about the essential elegance of the Magna Carta and the Westminster system. But when Rebecca died, Fran became soaked in a murderous reverie. It disturbed his conception of himself as a gentle man and disrupted his belief in a tradition of impartial justice. There was one prominent fantasy, as specific as it was brutal. It played repeatedly in his head, as if animated by something independent of him. Fran kidnaps Duggan, assisted by chloroform and ropes, and dumps him in the boot of a car that also contains the tools for his torture. Saws, pliers, hammers, maybe a blowtorch. Then Fran drives out to the bush. En route, Duggan regains consciousness but not his freedom, bound and panicking in his dark cell. He knows where he is but not where he's going. He wonders, will I be killed or just injured? And would he guess the identity and motivation of his captor as the car speeds over the gravel roads? They arrive at their remote destination. Fran turns the engine off. He can hear Duggan's muffled cries and his desperate kicking of the boot's canopy. Fran relishes the control, 
muses contentedly on how he has recreated the founding terror, refracted it back upon the monster. He opens the boot and stares at his daughter's killer. They're both a long way from England, a landscape of March flies and eucalypts. Fran can't hear the bird song. Neither of them can. Fran introduces himself. If Duggan had any doubt about the reasons for his captivity or the likely outcome, it's banished now. He struggles again and Fran grabs him roughly and dumps him to the ground. Then he collects his toolbox, filled with instruments once put to constructive use, but now reserved for torture. There commences sustained barbarism, cutting, sawing, burning. Fran then wraps piano wire around Duggan's neck and ties him to a tree. Wild animals and flies would do the rest, Fran told me. This fantasy was relayed quietly and shamefully by a man who only earlier had picked up the artwork of his son from the dining table and rhapsodized tenderly on its quality. I struggled because of the anger, Fran told me. I spent a lot of time wanting to kill him. That was quite a dark phase the first few months. I spent a lot of time speaking to a psychiatrist about the fantasies. I saw him for about two and a half years. It was useful. He told me that it's okay that I want to kill him or see him dead, that it's totally understandable. But the problem comes when he starts sharpening knives, buying rifles, or stalking his mother, or wanting to stalk him when he gets out of jail. But the anger itself is perfectly natural. I saw the guy every couple of months, but initially it was just once a month. I've seen a lot of violence in one way or another, Fran told me, but I've never hurt anything or anyone for the sake of it. I don't like hurting things. I'd rather create something than destroy something. But I could have cheerfully killed him without any remorse at that time. How well can you reconcile yourself to meaninglessness? For the Riles, this isn't a mere thought experiment. Their health hinges upon it. They are left with the hideous collision of the real, a murder, with an abstraction, meaninglessness. It is now their life's work to resign themselves to the meaninglessness of the act itself, not its consequences, while living a life in which they can create and respond to their own meaning. Keats called it negative capability, the ability to accept ambivalence or irresolution, to dwell in uncertainty without an irritable reaching for certainty. Thanks. Thanks, Martin. That's very powerful. And I guess it raises one question immediately uh, uh, for both writers. Are killers monsters? The sort of killers you've written about. Um, I don't believe that killers are born killers. Um, I think that a lot of people are capable of being murderers, uh, depending on the circumstances. Um, I think the most important circumstance that makes a person capable of murdering is um, their early childhood. Uh, if it's deprived of love and connection, it can result in a complete uh, inability to empathise with other people. But um, I don't think that most murderers are monsters. I think they're ordinary people who have been in extraordinary circumstances, sometimes of their own making, and they have uh, foolishly thought that murdering someone else will resolve their issues. Martin? Um, <clears throat> It remind, there, there was a section, this riff, this philosophical riff, um, which I removed from the book. Um, I kind of wanted to hem quite faithfully to the Riles. Um, but the riff was on evil, and it was a word that uh, frequently comes up, is often glibly used, but when the Riles used the word evil to describe Duggan and what had happened, and 
Uh, there's a distinction to be made between evil as an incarna a metaphysical incarnation and an evil act. Which, uh, th there's a distinction there. When the Riles used it, it wasn't glib. It was profound. And it was the strongest word. You saw the power of language there. It was the most powerful expression of their disgust. And you see how inadequate that word disgust is. Their daughter's been murdered. Um, evil, when they used it, seemed somehow appropriate. Um, but my riff in there were very suspicious of that word, evil, um, either because we, we might be irreligious, if there's a, a religious um, or, or a, an atheist rejection of that word, of its religiosity, or we believe that by referring to someone as evil, we're casting them off the spectrum of uh, normal life, of normal, um, apprehendable psychology. We're banishing them. And when we banish them from our spectrum of existence, we don't have to contemplate ourselves. We've relegated them to a place uh, above or below, and we don't have to contemplate any similarities. That evil is a rejection of self-examination. However, the metaphysicality of it was enormously uh, useful to the Raos themselves. Um, and one thing, this is deviating a little bit, uh, my apologies, but um, thinking about evil, which I got to from Monsters, um, one of my original interests in writing this book um, began with a Ron Rosenbaum book explaining Hitler. And his suggestion is, this is the odd thing about Hitler, is that we are still unsure about his motivations. Um, the two principal scholars originally of Hitler, uh, Hugh Trevor Roper and Alan Bullock, they were original titans of, of uh, Hitler scholarship. Both of them profoundly disagreed on Hitler's motivations. One argued that Hitler was entirely convinced of his own rectitude, that on the Jewish question, uh, he was entirely convinced he was doing the right thing. The other scholar said uh, that he was a mountebank, a scoundrel who was using the Jewish issue um, as uh, a useful leverage. Now, the point is, Ron Rosenbaum looks at, surveys all of this Hitler scholarship and says, in trying to explain this profound vacuum of meaning, we explain far more about ourselves. Um, I'll leave it there, yeah, but yes. that's I, speculative I stuff. We, are, we often, because we, we stare at a vacuum, we, we can't. We have to fill it speculatively, but we often reveal far more about ourselves. A comment, Mark? Um, well, of course, my main experience with murder is in the courtroom. I've prosecuted many, many cases of murder in New South Wales, and I can, honestly say that I can usually um, see something about the accused person or what he or she has done that I can identify with some aspect of my own life. Now, I'm not saying that I would murder in the same situation, but um, uh, I think that most common garden varieties of murder are committed by ordinary people in what they view at the time as extraordinary circumstances that they think are uh, unable to be resolved except by, by murder. Often it's because of insatiable greed, greed for money, greed for power. Um, in the case of kidnapped, um, it was, uh, the kidnapping was, was uh, carried out by Stephen Bradley because of uh, essentially greed for money. Ha however, it goes much, much deeper than that. Um, he was a man who had this terrible need to impress other people. And he could only impress other people, he thought, by uh, his wealth, the size of his house, the size of his car. And the person that he wanted to impress the most was his wife, Magda. And he had bought this huge house that they were living in, in Clontarf, which is a, a very expensive suburb in Sydney. And he'd bought it with money that he didn't have. He'd taken on incredible loans. He'd then lost his job. And he was in the situation where the house was about to be repossessed. So he just could not face the thought of the, the shame, the ignominy of l losing face with Magda, with the world. And then in that state of mind, he saw this photograph in the Sydney Morning Herald of, of uh, uh, Graham Thorne's father, Basil, holding the winning ticket in, of 100,000 pounds, which was an enormous sum of money in that day. 
and um, with this look of glee on his face. And Stephen Bradley looked at this photograph and he just felt this terrible sense of, of unfairness that this man had won this incredible windfall and here was, he, here was he and his wife Magda facing financial ruin. How unfair it was, how unjustified it was that this man was going to spend the rest of his life in great wealth and he was going to suffer this terrible fate. And it was then that the idea came to him of kidnapping the, the, one of the children of this man who'd won the Opera House Lottery. Mm, and I, I think the way that you draw that character does connect with your, your statement that, you know, hey, this could be me, you know, the greed part. Um, and, and it's a great thing to say, I think, that, um, you know, we have to see elements of ourselves in all these crimes. I think in the senseless crimes that's more difficult. But that suggests, uh, or, or that um, brings up the question of what, it, what is it about crime that so intrigues all of us? Why are we, so many of us, watching series on TV, particularly if they're Scandinavian, The Killing? And, we, you know, we spend a great deal of time looking at the mind of the criminal and the motivations and so on. And in particular, this genre is an interesting one. And I, I said that there was some disagreement about the, the um, category. True crime, what is that? And why would we be drawn um, into quite extensive descriptions of crimes? Any idea? Um. There's a very obvious fascination, um, which seems bottomless. Um, and there's this great, partially sophisticated revival of, of true crime at the moment. Um, however, and this sort of answers that question in your previous one about monsters, the vast, almost uniformly, the police I worked with, uh, the psychologist I spoke to, the criminologist I spoke to, um, would profile a murderer mostly the same way. They are emotionally inadequate people and murder is an act of uh, vulgar impetuousness, or it's a, similar to what Mark was saying, it's a crazy solution to a problem, which they're not emotionally or intellectually equipped to solve in a civil way. Um, it's actually quite banal, largely. Um, our interest, you know, and this is, I've been pushing this a lot on, in, in, in the publicity for this book. This book is intended as a repudiation of true crime. It's my opinion, as it was my publisher, who was very sceptical of my proposal initially. He had never, Scribe had never put out true crime, I, I think. I think this, this might be the first one. And the reason for that is Henry, the publisher, believed, as I did, that the vast majority of it is exploitative. It fixates on gore. It ignores the victim. We rarely care for the victim's name. Uh, we care less for the consequences of the crime. Uh, we have this juvenile fixation on the supposed villainy um, of the criminals. Uh, if women are involved and sexualized violence is involved, then there's this grubby purience to it as well. Um, I cite the example of the sun splashed uh, with Reva Steenkamp uh, after Oscar Pistorius shot her. They splashed with her in a immodest pose, pink bikini. Um, it was a model glamour shot that she had made. They splashed with that after she had been shot to death. Um, there was this kind of frisson there that was kind of sickening. Um, this book is meant as a repudiation of all of that. I haven't done anything new. There's lots of fine, thoughtful, reflective true crime out there. But the majority of it really appeals to our worst angels. We turn barbarism into entertainment and we do it witlessly. We do it all the time. We do it without thought. I, I agree that there's an insatiable appetite for true crime and indeed for crime fiction. But... Um, uh, I must admit, in, in the courtroom, I often get people coming and sitting in the public gallery at the back and coming up to me afterwards and saying, this was much more interesting than going to the movies up the road. Um, I, th I think that people have an insatiable appetite for crime because as human beings, we, we, we have an interest in people behaving badly. We have a particular interest for, in people breaking the rules. And if you go back to primary school children, 
what are they the most interested in? The kids that are naughty and that get punished. And, and <laughs> we're no different to that. We're interested in those people who have broken the rules of our society and have been punished. Um, you mentioned senseless crime. Um, I don't believe that there is such a thing as senseless crime, or if there is, it's from the, from the viewpoint of the observer. It appears to be senseless. But at the time, for the perpetrator, it makes perfectly good sense. And if you look at Stephen Bradley as an example, if you try and look at what he was doing objectively, you would shake your head and you'd say, how on earth did he possibly think that he was going to get away with this kidnapping and the death of this little boy? How could he possibly have thought that it was going to succeed? Didn't he appreciate the incredible risk that he was running to the life of that little boy? And the answer is no. He had this delusion in his mind that he was a man of great perspicacity, a man who could see all the potential problems that were going to arise during the kidnapping. He thought within a few hours these parents would have got the money from the bank, paid the ransom, the boy would be returned home, he'd be tucked up in bed that night and everybody would be perfectly happy. So it would all be over and he'd be £25,000 richer. A bad case of... Magical thinking. Absolutely. He was delusional. Mm. And, and mm. the mistakes that he made in planning the kidnapping were extraordinary. Mm. So that we can look back and say, look, eventually he would have been caught no matter what. But at the time, he didn't realise that. And, and I've found in, in, in my day work that it's very much the same, that people commit crimes, um, they think that they're being very clever and ingenious in committing them, but in reality they, they make the most egregious mistakes. So that raises the question to me of, of is there a kind of, I, I think possibly Mark you're saying this, that there is a kind of a warped sense to these crimes which investigators need to understand before they can close their files. And, and one of the most disturbing things about your book, Martin, was that there never seemed to be that. Nobody ever really made sense, even uh, how, however much they tried, however many psychologists talked to the killer, whatever, that no one ever made sense of it. No, and I don't want people to infer from the title, A Murder Without Motive, that uh, my job was to triumphantly improve upon uh, the courts and police and psychologists' failure to uh, find a motive. Um, it's not. It's more about irresolution, how that compounds trauma for the Riles, um, and also how that um, kind of chilling vacancy that is James Duggan, the killer, um, how various parts of the justice system, uh, from you know, court-appointed psychologists uh, to the legal counsel, um, to the judge in her sentencing, uh, to the police themselves. How they each had competing professional philosophies, um, slightly competing professional obligations, um, or, or complementary um, professional obligations, but each of them distinct. How each of them attempted to make sense of something that was apparently meaningless. And I think Mark's correct, and this was um, when Mark said, it may uh, seem senseless, but at the time for Duggan himself, it might have made a lot of sense. However unfathomable uh, that sense is to anyone else. Um, a psychotherapist, and uh, it was interesting, I was a Freudian psychotherapist, he had also been a psychiatrist. Um, he believed there's no such thing as a murder without motive. That, however incomprehensible to us, at that time, at that point, there was something comprehensible to Duggan. He could never articulate it though. Um, and there is this chilling vacancy there. But to go back to what I started, it's not meant to be this self-aggrandizing uh, traipse back through the evidence where the journalist heroically kind of uncovers. It's not that. Right. The irresolution is integral to the Riles trauma and it was integral in animating these kind of competing professional obligations. Mm. I mean, to go from, from um, 
the sublime to the ridiculous, that's not quite the right words, but I mean, you know, those of us who used to get some satisfaction reading Agatha Christie, the evidence was brought forward against each of them, and then, of course, uh, the butler, or whoever did it, was finally flushed out into the open. And that, of course, probably accounts for the fact that Agatha Christie sold so many millions of books. But um, I think both our panellists are saying, look, look, this ain't real life. But nevertheless, um, it does seem with the advance in forensics and forensic science and all the other uh, paraphernalia of the legal and justice system that no more satisfying answer was found. And is this an argument for torture or what is this an argument for? Um, no, there was great, uh, you read the sentencing remarks in this, in this case and uh, legal counsel, both the state um, and defense and the judge, all of them express this sort of sorrowful frustration um, at the inadequacy and the opacity of the psychological reports. They yielded nothing aberrant about Duggan. The mystery was only further compounded. Um, I had distantly surmised psychopathy because of his behavior following the crime in, in this petrol station. Um, but the psychological reports yielded nothing. And the legal counsel were, it's, the sentencing remarks are peppered with the words enigma and mystery. Um, it's an, I'll answer it this way. You, I, I said before we turn barbarism into entertainment, and we do. And a function or a bit of that entertainment is resolution. Even with true crime, and we should know this in all of our lives, that our lives are messy, they often don't make sense. We have to make, try to enforce narratives on it, try to make sense of our own lives. There's not a beginning, middle, and end to most things. There's just not. Um, but because we treat crime and barbarism as entertainment, we crave that resolution. The riles don't get any re resolution, and the readers uh, won't either. No. And, and I you, think you my situation... Really want them to. Yeah, I was going to say that... Um, it's a bit different. I... Be, yeah, because Mark's <laughs> looking... Because, Mark, you were looking back, you've yeah. got a fascinating account of the methods of investigation that were in use in 1960, and anybody reading it in um, 2016 goes, what? They did what? How did they possibly miss that clue? Do you want to say more about that? Well, uh, at the time in 1960, when this um, kidnapping and murder occurred and the trial was in 1961, there were some enduring mysteries about the case and I've attempted to explore those and to provide some answers. Um, with the benefit of um, uh, looking at the whole case in retrospect, with the benefit of uh, ad more advanced forensic science that we have today, uh, with the benefit of, I suppose, my knowledge of, of 30 years in the criminal courts. Um, one of those mysteries was how did Stephen Bradley turn a voluntary lift of Graham Thorne on his way to school into a forced abduction. Uh, another mystery was how did the boy come to die and why? Because it was not in Stephen Bradley's interests for the boy to die. It made it much less likely that he was going to succeed in getting the ransom monies. And uh, the third enduring mystery was um, did Stephen Bradley's wife Magda know about the plan beforehand or did she realise after the event that her husband was responsible um, for this murder because about three months after the body of, of um, Graham Thorne was found they precipitously left Australia um, in a very um, surreptitious manner uh, trying not to leave any clues, not telling anybody that they were leaving or why they were going um, and a lot of journalists at the time concluded from that that Magda Bradley must have known um, about the kidnapping and I've, I've looked into that aspect as well. So that, that was the subject of a lot of conjecture at the time in, in the newspapers, in the media generally uh, and indeed even in the trial. C could you tell us a little bit about the blue Ford custom line? A car, incidentally, that I loved when I was that age. Um, within 24 hours, the police knew that the kidnapper had used a 1955 blue Ford 
custom line to commit the kidnapping. And they knew that because a man had gone by at the time and seen Stephen Bradley. And this man, unluckily for Stephen Bradley, was a car aficionado who could name every single model of Ford car that there was and even tell you the correct technical name of the paint that had been used on the car. Mm. So the police knew exactly what sort of car uh, the kidnapper was driving. They also knew very early in the piece that the kidnapper had a European accent. Um, the police embarked upon the most momentous search that up until that time had ever occurred. They decided that they would get police to interview every single owner of 1955 Ford Custom Lines. But they made one fatal mistake. They assumed that no sane kidnapper would have used his own car. So they thought they were looking for a car that had been stolen or borrowed. So every single owner of this car was interviewed and asked, where was your car? Was it borrowed? Was it stolen? Who was using it on that day? And Stephen Bradley was one of the car owners that was interviewed. And he'd been given some warning that he was going to be interviewed about this and he had prepared his answers very thoroughly and he convinced the police that no, his car was just in the garage, it hadn't been used that day. So his name was just ticked off along with thousands of others as being, well, it's not this car, it's not this man. And the fact that this man who had a 1955 blue Ford custom line also had a European accent didn't seem to interest the police one iota. Mm. And you describe uh, a primitive spreadsheet system that somehow didn't catch these cross-references or go anywhere near it. Yeah, it was the very first time that the police had used a system that's called running sheets. So every single investigation and its result was put on a sheet of paper and filed in folders. And this was supposedly so that somebody could go in and, and read the whole police investigation in one go if they had the time. But the, the danger w was that there were literally many, many dozens of police involved in the investigation. Nobody had a sufficient overview to be able to put the, the pieces together. It's a, a, a danger, a risk that the police acknowledge today and they have various methods today to avoid that sort of thing. But the running sheet system was brand new at that time and they fell smack bang into the trap. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go back to Martin's book in a moment, but just w one further point actually applies to both books. The setting in both these books is fascinating the setting in which these crimes took place. And uh, reading your book, Mark, uh, I, I did, um, you know, almost fondly think back to 1960s Sydney, but a bit like you look back fondly at some damaged old teddy bear or something, I thought, wow, that was such an innocent place wh where these things were happening. And of course, part of the reason that it, it could happen was because of that innocence of those times, for instance, publishing the Opera House Lottery results. So the setting of Sydney 1960 seemed to be important for you. The setting of Perth, Mindari Keys, uh, sorry, the date again was? Uh, of the, the date of the murder, 2004. Of the murder? 2004. 2004. So I came here and the mid-90s, but I must admit, even 10 years later, I knew nothing about Mindari Keys, except people up there were um, pretty well suntanned and went to the coast a lot. But, um, Martin, I'm wondering if you'd like to talk about the suburban setting of the crime. The fact that, I guess, compared with Mark's book, um, there wasn't an extensive investigation. The killer just about gave himself away anyway, he left so many clues it was almost impossible not to catch him. But what was it about those suburbs that produced this sort of crime, do you think? Um, yeah, there's a big suburban aspect. It's partially memoir. I had to be very 
arrive at a delicate ratio between myself and the family. But um, the personal aspects, which become the suburban aspects, um, are that my brother knew the killer. I'd known him very well. I'd known him for about seven or eight years. There was something of antagonists. Um, and I think their last encounter ended with, um, with Duggan being punched, punched to the ground. Um, and in, in a lot of ways, Duggan's culture was, was my own. So in contextualizing, and you said what, I mean, I'm, I'm careful to make a distinction between contextualization and causation. Um, but the circles in which Duggan ran, and, and which may have contributed to the crime, I think played at least subtle, if not overt roles, was a suburban subculture um, of hyper-aggressive, hyper-violent young men. They found definition in opposition. That opposition would tend to be violent. Uh, violence was a currency. Your capacity to withstand or commission violence uh, would determine your status. Uh, women were treated as trophies. Um, there was a, a, a kind of gross sexual entitlement there. Um, the, the definition found in opposition that I was talking about also expressed itself in, in petty vandalism. Um, there was one graffiti crew I knew of, their sort of signature beyond their tags uh, was uh, bin arson. That was their little motif. Um, I talk a lot about the graffiti crews and, and the, funnily enough, like certain aesthetic pleasures, but also the pleasures of, of tribalism and the protection um, and the comfort to your identity that that conferred. Um, and for someone as inchoate, as frustrated, as angry, as inarticulate as James Duggan was, um, the role of, his, of these suburban subcultures in providing him with some identity, some identification, um, but them also being incredibly dangerous. Um, this banal collection of uh, impetuous youth, um, of the violence, of the misogyny, of the risk-taking. Uh, these are really common ingredients, but they're highly combustible in this area. And, and I, I should say that this is not unique to Mindari. Um, but Mindari is where it happened. And then, you know, I tried to get a physical evocation of the place as well. Um, there's an extraordinary concentration of British expats, some 30% of Mindari and the adjacent suburbs, Whitford's, um, Currambine, Joondalup, etc. Um, all have, they're the top seven suburbs in all of Australia, of the highest British concentration. So you've got this sun-bleached place, this really brazen light, the ocean, this long, glorious, uninterrupted coastline. Um, and this, this British subculture there as well. So there's a physical evocation of, of Mindari, but the suburban aspects uh, were very much that, that sort of uh, adolescent underbelly. So it sounds like it wasn't very hard for you to research it because you grew up there. Um, so in a way, you could tap back into that pretty easily as, as you did today when the, when the sun started getting hotter. And you went, yeah, I remember this. Yeah. Um, but Mark, how did you ever get back into 1960s Sydney? Well, I was eight years old and uh, Graham Thorne was eight years old and I was very much aware of the kidnapping. In fact, I had a uh, photograph of him that I'd got from the newspaper pasted up on the wall of my bedroom so that if I came upon him in the street, I could tell my parents and they could notify the police. Um, I have had dozens and dozens of people of my age and older, little older, coming up to me and saying that their childhood was changed by the kidnapping of Graham Thorne. That before the kidnapping, they were allowed to play unsupervised in the streets, in nearby bushland, in parks, go to their neighbour's place, um, whereas with the kidnapping, um, afterwards they were, they were restricted in where they could play, where they could go. Um, they were basically told, you've got to remain under our close supervision. So their childhood changed. So in a sense, the kidnapping of Graham Thorne um, did cause a loss of innocence for Australia. And it wasn't just in Sydney, it wasn't just in New South Wales. It gripped the whole nation of Australia for months and months on end. I mean, the, the, firstly, the kidnapping, then the finding of the body, 
then the disclosure that the, that the suspect had escaped overseas and, and the worry about whether he could be extradited back to Australia, then the proceedings to extradite him back, and then finally the trial. So all of that took um, about nine months and it was front page yeah. news day yeah. after day for those nine months. An amazing drama. Let, let's take some questions from the audience. I'm sure there are some. And I'll try and gaze out and have a look at a raised hand. Anybody got any questions? Yes, one here and one down there. There's a lady in the aisle here. Um, thank you for those discussions. I found it very enlightening. I was just wondering whether in your research or your writings, either of you came across the work of Robert Hare and a book called Without Conscience, which gives pretty concrete scientific evidence that psychopaths who commit these sorts of crimes have brains which are different from other people. They're now known as subspecies predators. I'm just curious whether this research has now been replicated by one of his other medical professionals, whether any of you came across any of this? Um, I haven't come across that book or that author, uh, but I do uh, see many uh, reports in the courts in which people are labelled in one way or another. I don't like the term psychopath because it, it places somebody outside the mainstream of humanity. I prefer the term narcissist. And there are lots of narcissists amongst us. They say that the best managing directors of large corporations are complete narcissists. Um, it's just that they've channeled their narcissistic tendencies in a way that's acceptable in society. Um, I, I would repeat what I said earlier, that I don't think people are made, are born to be narcissists. I think that people become narcissistic um, often because of emotionally deprived childhoods. Yes, there's another question down the back there. Thank you. Thanks for that question. Good one. Can Mark, I, sorry, I could, could, question, could I... question this one for Mark. Um, you mentioned that uh, the... Stephen Bradley had a European accent. I recall reading. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sure. I recall reading that uh, at the time that Stephen Bradley was not his real name. It was a it was a name that he uh, changed by deed poll or something. Uh, is this correct? Uh, what was his real name and what was it, what was his real nationality? I'm thinking of that line from My Fair Lady where they go, you can tell that he was born Hungarian. Is that correct? <laughs> uh, Stephen Bradley was born in Hungary. He had a Hungarian name. Um, some years after coming to Australia, he changed his name. He anglicised it because his uh, name of origin was almost unpronounceable for... Uh, Anglo-Saxon Australians in those days where there, people weren't nearly as used to foreign names like Tedeschi um, as they are today. Um, so uh, there was nothing mysterious about it. A lot of people who came from overseas to Australia changed their names. Thank you. Yes, another question down the front here, please. Where's our roving mic? Ah, uh, there he is. Just down. Uh, Oh, okay. Would you mind repeating the... If I can repeat the question when I hear it, okay. Um, was he a neighbour? I read somewhere years ago that he lived only a few doors down from where, the, uh, where Graham lived. Is that true? Is it true that the killer lived just a few doors from the victim? Uh, Graham Thorne lived in Bondi. Stephen Bradley lived uh, in Clontarf. They, they were on opposite sides of Sydney. What, what you're probably referring to is that Stephen Bradley dumped Graham Thorne's body only about three or four kilometres away from where he lived, which was 
just an example of his carelessness, his laziness. You would think, though, from that, that the police would have focused their inquiries on people who had 1955 blue Ford custom lines in that area, but they didn't. They didn't have those nice glass screens that they use on television. You know where they, and they, and they use lots of markers and, and they put lots of photographs up. I feel that we could all probably conduct a better investigation than the New South Wales Police of 1960, but we'll never know. Yes, there's a question down the front and another one there, I think. Um, my, my question is to you, um, Martin. Um, I really applaud uh, the idea that you're not writing gratuitous um, true crime. And I wonder, do you see this as, um, as a trend that's going to build? Did everybody hear that? Does Martin see that the trend away from the more gratuitous form of true crime writing is something that's going to continue? Um, the short answer is I, I, I don't know. Um, the making, making of a murderer, uh, serial, uh, what else? There's another, the jinx. They're distinguished by much greater production values. Um, journalistically, they're probably a little more sophisticated. I still find them problematic. Um, two of the three are acts of advocacy. Serial at least accepts irresolution. It doesn't try to, um, sorry, I'm, I, I'm kind of turning my head, but I need to, I've been told before I need to basically kiss this microphone, so. Um, serial at least respects or is intellectually comfortable enough um, with irresolution. Whether or not it's a trend, look, I, I, you know, I don't know. Um, I'm not suggesting for a second that I've done something new, nor am I suggesting this kind of pompous moral threshold that only I have um, you know, the rectitude to meet. Um, but as I said before, I, I do feel very passionately, um, I, I feel a passionate dismissal of the majority of true crime. Um, I'm touched by the reception to my book whether or not that signals a trend, I don't know. We can, we can only hope. Was there another question down there? There's a gentleman in the end of that row. Anyone that went to Simon Winchester this morning might remember him talking about when he, like bringing his heart and his emotions to journalism, particularly in relation to things like the um, Bloody Sunday in Ireland, which he reported on. I think there is a link between what he was saying and what Martin is saying. But I'll work all that out at the end of the festival when I start putting ideas together. This is a festival of ideas, remember? Yeah. Um, you, you both mentioned at some point regarding um, the mental health of the... Um, <clears throat> my, my question is, how, how, how much do you think that more understanding of mental health um, can possibly prevent these sort of crimes in our society? How much does an understanding of mental health help to prevent crimes in society? As far as uh, my book is concerned, there was never the slightest suggestion that Stephen Bradley was in any way mentally ill. But if you look at the statistics for crime generally, uh, there's a very close correlation between um, uh, mental illness and crime. And if you go into the jails, there's an enormously high rate of two things amongst perpetrators who have been convicted of serious crime, mental illness and being victims of sexual abuse. Yeah, I was, I was going to um, quickly add to that. I think you basically said it. Um, going through the numbers and the stats at Victoria Police, it wasn't just uh, a link between mental health and, and criminality, uh, but also victimhood as well. Um, the mentally unwell were, were being victimised at much, much higher rates as well. But in my case also, James Duggan was subject to a battery of psychological and psychiatric examination. It yielded, according to the therapists, nothing aberrant about him mentally. Um, my point about social intervention, if that's not too crude, 
um, a summary of your question, uh, comes in the form of the culture around Duggan, this cancerous masculinity, this great inarticulacy. By inarticulacy, I'm not speaking about eloquence, I'm not speaking about vocabulary, but emotional expression. Um, an ease with that and having people around you that are receptive to that. Um, a practice of inner examination and speech and sharing um, that can help quell uh, this, this, what, what was in him, this great inchoate frustration and anger. I think Duggan was very frustrated by his inability to impose his will on the world. Um, so for me, that social intervention there, it comes with how dads talk to their boys. It talks to, uh, it's about how boys talk to each other, uh, how they find definition and meaning in constructive things rather than destructive things. Um, and the treatment of women is a, is a big factor in, in my book, I think, as well. Thank you. And that brings this session to a close. I think it's been great, and I really thank you for your questions and for your attention. And I would like to thank both our writers, Martin Mackenzie Murray and Mark Tedeschi.